I don't think that uh, my husband, although he said he was going to go back south and fight to change the, the system, and he was thinking about not just in Alabama or in Georgia, but he was talking about making our society more inclusive, changing the system so that everybody could participate. Uh, although he talked about that, at that time, we never dreamed that we would have an opportunity, that, well, that we would be projected into the forefront of the struggle as we were. Uh, we were just going to work from, as he said, a black uh, Baptist church pulpit. Uh, that was the freest place, uh, you know, in the society at that time. But we had no no idea that what God had in store for us. And I do believe it was a divine intervention that we were thrust into the forefront of the struggle. After we married, we moved to Montgomery, Alabama, where my husband had accepted an invitation to be the pastor of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church before long, we found ourselves in the middle of the Montgomery bus boycott, and Martin was elected leader of the protest movement. As the boycott continued, I had a growing sense that I, had, I was involved in something so much greater than myself, something of profound historic importance. I came to the realization that we had been thrust into the forefront of a movement to liberate oppressed people, not only in Montgomery, but also throughout our country, and this movement had worldwide implications. I felt blessed to have been called to be a part of such noble, a noble and historic cause. Well, first of all, I was extremely excited and about what was going on, because this was something that had never happened before. And I knew this was history making. And I also knew that it was not only happening in Montgomery, but it was, the impact of this was really much further, much more uh, extensive than Montgomery, because during the Montgomery, Boycott. We heard that there was a boycott in Johannesburg, South Africa, of buses, and also there was one in Mobile and, and in Tallahassee, so it was like it was spreading. But we also knew that the struggle was much bigger than a boycott. It was about the injustices in our society. It was about changing uh, the society in such a way and changing the laws of the government. Uh, locally and certainly nationally we had to create new laws to protect us and protect the rights once they were won. And we even experienced what was like modern day miracles uh, when things happened, like when the Supreme Court had ruled on bus desegregation. We were in court that day <clears throat> because, <clears throat> excuse me, the city of Montgomery had, was having a hearing and was trying to outlaw our transportation system. And if it had, maybe the people would have gotten tired and gone back to the buses. And my husband was very worried. And I said to him, you know what? I think that by the time we go to court and by the time the judge rules, that the Supreme Court will have ruled. And, and, and we felt that if the Supreme Court ruled, it would be in our favor. And that was my consolation. And sure enough, while we were in court, Associated Press, uh, an Associated Press reporter handed, handed a note to my husband, and it said, the Supreme Court of the United States has ruled today that bus segregation in Montgomery is unconstitutional. So that ended the court session. So it was that kind of thing, uh, an intervention again, that helped us to realize that we were doing the right thing and you continue to do that. And that more importantly, that we had been, we had been called, I had been called personally to be in Montgomery at that time because I had always 
did sort my purpose as as a teenager. I began to think about what my life was going to be like, and going to college that was one one level. Uh, going beyond there was the next level. Going to prepare for a music career, but when I got to Boston, there was. I realized another reason and for me being there. And then I wondered why Martin Luther King Jr., <clears throat> a minister that I didn't think I would ever marry a minister, and then he was going back south. I wanted to go back south, but I wasn't prepared to go at that time because I had to finish my work. And finally, in Montgomery, and then things began to happen, So, it, and the house was bombed. So I. I did a lot of soul searching after that and tried to remember, you know, try to think back of how I got there. And I, re I realized that all my life I had been being prepared for this role and that we were supposed to be there, be there in Montgomery. And it, it was a great feeling of satisfaction because I realized that I had found my purpose. I realized when Montgomery started that this was probably the reason we were called to Montgomery. I, after my house was bombed and uh, of course the, all the threats on my husband's life, on my life too, I realized I could have been killed as well because uh, I was in the house when the bomb uh, hit the front porch with my young baby and the callers had been calling and they, they said that they were going to bomb my house, told my husband they were going to bomb his house and kill his family if he didn't leave town in three days. Uh, and uh, of course he didn't leave town in three days and they did bomb the house. So knowing that they meant what they said because they actually did uh, bomb the house, that they uh, wasn't, it wasn't, the bomb was not um, strong enough to destroy the house. But if it had been, then, you know, that would have been very, very sad for all of us, certainly for me and my baby and my husband. But the fact is that I had to deal with the fact that if I continued in the struggle, I too could be killed. And that's when I started praying very seriously about my commitment and whether or not I would be able to stick with my husband to continue in the struggle. And of course, I wasn't it wasn't that difficult. Uh, it was a struggle, but I knew that we were doing the right thing. I always felt that what, Montgomery, what was happening in Montgomery was part of God's will and purpose. And we were put there to be in the forefront of that struggle. And it wasn't just a struggle relegated to Montgomery, Alabama, uh, the, the South, but that it had worldwide implications. And, 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 it, and I felt really a sense of fulfillment uh, that I hadn't felt before, that this was really what I was supposed to be doing. And, and, and it was a, a great blessing to have discovered this and to be doing what was God's will for your life. After we were successful in desegregating the buses in Montgomery, the nonviolent revolution we launched in Montgomery spread like a prairie fire across the southern states my husband led nonviolent protest campaigns against racism and segregation in cities across the South as well as in, the, in Chicago, Cleveland, and other cities in the North. During this time, I had three more children and participated in movement activities as much as possible. People ask me how was I able to do this and raise four children at the same time. I can only reply that when God calls you to a great task, he provides you with the strength to accomplish what he has called you to do. Faith and prayer, family and friends were always available when I needed them. And of course, Martin and I always were there for each other. I learned that when you are willing to make sacrifices for a great cause, you will never be alone because you will have divine companionship and the support of good people. This same faith and cosmic companionship sustained me after my husband was assassinated and gave me the strength 
to make my contribution to carrying forward his unfinished work. Well, it was the belief that we were doing the right thing. Um, because it had never happened before, it was like, you know, the Supreme Court decision had been rendered in 1954, and this was in 1955. And we were all motivated by that and knowing that uh, this meant the beginning of breaking down the system of segregation. We, we recognized that if the schools could desegregate, this means that other things can desegregate as well. So with Montgomery happening, it was like an inv intervention there that God had planted Rosa Parks and, and, and also Martin Luther King Jr. And, and, and so you had this sense that something very, very significant was happening and that it had would have impact beyond uh, around the world, that we were not only struggling to free the people of the South, but oppressed people around the world. And we had no idea where it was leading, but we had a sense that it was leading to something more, much more significant than what we were involved in at the time. And each time, there was um, things, for instance, the stabbing incident where Martin was stabbed in Harlem. I mean, it's like it made no sense, except that God was preparing us for something even bigger. And then when the Nobel Peace Prize came along, which we were rewarded in a sense for our struggles, it was like, but this is still not it, because we have not achieved the peace that he was awarded the war represented, but we still have a long way to go. So it was, it was always not knowing what the future held, but we knew that we were on the right path and you had a sense of, as Martin used to say, cosmic companionship. And that kept you going. When I say uh, I was married to the cause, uh, I was married to my husband whom I, loved. I learned to love. It wasn't love at first sight. But I also became married to the cause. It was my cause, and that's the way I felt about it. And so when my husband was no longer there, then I could continue to, in that cause, and I prayed that God would give me the, the direction for my life to give me the strength to do what it was that, and the ability to do what it was that he had called me to do. And I was trying to seek what is it that I'm supposed to do now that Martin is no longer here. And I finally de determined that it was to develop an institution. I was already involved in building the institution, but I wasn't sure that that was it. I uh, thought maybe it might have been with women, but then, of course, uh, I didn't get that feeling in particular, but it always because I thought there was a need to have more women involved in organizing them around as, as a support group to my husband, and I encouraged him to do that. And he, he didn't do that in particular. And I thought, well, maybe then that might be what I'm supposed to do. But then I finally determined that it was the King Center because Martin's message and his meaning uh, was so powerful and his spirit, I felt, needed to be continued. I mean, I know that people's spirit lived on, but I think in a, in a very positive, meaningful way that young people would know that that influence was being continued. And so I felt that my role then was to develop an institution, to institutionalize his philosophy, his principles of nonviolence, and his methodology of uh, social change. And that's what I have spent my years doing. Uh, 27 years I was this president, founder, CEO. I'm still the founder, you're never always the founder. But uh, I retired from that position in, in 1995, and um, my son Dexter is now in that position. But I still continue to do all the work that I can to reach as many people as I can with the message. I grew up in the Deep South. It was totally segregated in terms of race. 
and everything was separate but unequal. Um, I had wonderful parents who inspired me to be the best person that I could be. My mother always told me that I was going to go to college, uh, even if she didn't have a one dress to put on. And so I grew up knowing that I was going to somehow find a way out of the situation I grew up in. I grew up on a farm. We were uh, culturally deprived, but we were not poor in the sense that we didn't have very much. We had limited uh, resources because in the country at that time, nobody had very much, and we had probably more than most people. As an African-American child growing up in the segregated South, I was told one way or another almost every day of my life that I wasn't as good as a white child. When I went to the movies with other black children, we had to sit in the balcony while the white kids got to sit in the better seats below. We had to walk to school while the white children rode in school buses paid for by our parents' taxes. Such messages saying we were inferior were a daily part of our lives. But I was blessed with parents who taught me not to let anyone make me feel like it wasn't good enough. And as my mother told me, you are just as good as anyone else. You get an education and try to be somebody then you won't have to be kicked around by anybody, and you won't have to depend on anyone for your livelihood, not even a man. Well, my parents taught me some wonderful values that have, have lasted me, uh, have stayed with me, and I've built on them uh, throughout my life. If it hadn't been for my parents, who I consider heroes, uh, I wouldn't be the kind of person I am. I am very thankful and grateful for them. They're both deceased now. Um, but uh, I went to Antioch College uh, in Yellow Springs, Ohio. And Antioch College, as you probably realize, is a, a college that uh, teaches uh, people how to have a world view. Uh, and uh, all races were represented at the time and religions. And uh, the, the an excellent education. I had a very um, broad background, liberal arts, and I had the work experience as well. And uh, Antioch was about making change in society, it was about social change, uh, which was preparing me at that time for the role that I would play later in life. You know, I was inspired by um, um, the words of, of, of many, many, many persons, and um, I, I, I don't recall right at the moment just which, but the words of, I used to recite a lot of poetry, and I was in, in, uh, inspired by, uh, by the words of, uh, of, of Longfellow, lives of great men all remind us. You know, even though I was a female, but you know, back then, we didn't think of it as male, female as much, but I thought of it, of course that means me too. Uh, you know, lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and depart and be blind as footprints on the sand of time and so on. I was inspired by the likes of Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt because I was uh, high school, in high school during the, the 40s and of course President Roosevelt was at that time one of my favorite, he was a hero, a hero of mine, and I used to love to hear him speak, and I recognized the voice whenever he came on the radio, because we didn't have televisions back then. And um, uh, I never got to meet Mrs. Roosevelt, Mrs. Mary McLeod Bethune, a black woman who became an advisor to President Roosevelt and, and, and uh, founded a school in Florida, the Bethune-Cookman College was another great black woman that was a role model for me. Um, my, uh, my teacher from high school, uh, and uh, then of course there was Paul Robeson, who was a great singer uh, and had such a commanding presence uh, when I first met him and he performed. Uh, you know, you could just feel so much power when he walked out on the stage 
and, uh, and his words were, were so meaningful. Um, his very deep voice, both speaking and singing. You know, it was, a, it was the way it was. I didn't like it, and I always felt less... Uh, I, I knew I was important as they were, but it just, it, it sort of walked down a curtain, you know, in a sense, on my, my selfhood and, and helped me to be more, to become more determined to, to get out of that situation and to try to do something about it when I, when I, find, when I had an opportunity. Uh, so I was determined myself to get an education, to get uh, the best education possible, uh, and and to be able to come back and give back something to that community, and that was really what I went to college with my mind on, as well as as of, as the New England Conservatory of Music. Well, I studied elementary education and music in Antioch, and um, I couldn't get a full music degree, but I always wanted to study music. That was my first love. In high school, I had a teacher who influenced me greatly, uh, Miss Olive J. Williams, and she was uh, versatile in music, and I wanted to be like her. She exposed me to the world of classical music. Before then, I had never heard classical music. She exposed me also to the great composers, uh, of, of the world, and as well as black performers, which I didn't know about at the time, Marian Anderson, uh, Paul Robeson, L. Roland Hayes, uh, and Dorothy Maynard, and others. And so I uh, got my foundation and my beginning there, and then at Antioch I built on that with another teacher named Walter Anderson. And he was the one who uh, eventually in, in encouraged me to apply when I graduated from Antioch to the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston. So I attended the New England Conservatory on a scholarship, scholarship to Antioch, a scholarship to the conservatory. And of course, after my first uh, semester in, in, in Boston in 1951, I met Martin Luther King Jr. And of course, Martin Luther King Jr. was studying for his doctorate in uh, systematic theology. And he was going to go back south and pastor a church, a Baptist church, and he was looking for a wife. And I wasn't looking for a husband, but, uh, but he was a wonderful human being, and he made everyone feel special, and he made me very, feel very special, you know, as a woman. Uh, but I still resisted his uh, overtures, and, but after he persisted, I had to pray about it because I've, I've had my parents were religious. I was brought up, brought up in uh, in the church, and I had a, a strong faith. I always believed that there was a purpose for my life, and and that I had to seek that purpose. And that if I discovered that purpose, then I believed that I would be successful in what I was was doing. And I thought I had found that purpose when I decided that music was my uh, was going to be my career, uh, uh, concert singing. I was going to be trained as a concert singer at the New England Conservatory of Music. I studied uh, voice uh, and uh, the first year, and after I met Martin and prayed about whether or not I should open myself to that relationship, I had a dream, and in that dream I made, was made to feel that I should allow myself to be open and stop fighting the relationship, and that's what I did, and of course the rest is history. I could. I finished conservatory uh, with a degree in uh, voice and music education, and my second instrument was violin. I started doing concerts when I was a college student, and after we moved to Montgomery, my husband was called to church there, I continued to perform. I performed concerts um, the first year, got pregnant, had to stop, performed between babies, I have four children, uh, and um, I was doing standard concerts when I had my fourth child. I realized I could not continue to do that uh, that way, and I developed the freedom concert concept where I narrated the story of the civil rights movement that we were involved in 
uh, and sang freedom songs in between the narrations that told the story of our struggle from Montgomery to Washington at that time. In 1964, I did my debut uh, with my freedom concert at Town Hall, raised money for the cause, and from the rest of the time, I raised money for my husband's organization, doing freedom concerts across the country and so forth. I think what, need, what I've tried to do is to empower people to understand that they can make a difference and by using the method of nonviolence as a way of life. I mean, it becomes internalized into your life. And so everything that you seek to do, you use those principles and those steps based on those principles and the steps, the methodology, so that if you have a, a problem, a conflict in whatever it is you're doing, you be able to better resolve that. And if it's dealing with people, you know, certainly you know how to resolve that and become reconciled and to move forward. So today we have many problems that are, some of them are new problems. You have the human rights struggle continuing, but you also have problems like HIV, A and AIDS, uh, uh, which, uh, which, which I think young people have to be dedicated to find uh, ways to deal with these problems, to educate the whole world, because the world as a whole needs to educate. We have a lot of education that needs to be done here in this country so that people can avoid uh, getting the disease. And of course, we know that people can live with the disease, but there's a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done there. Uh, there, there, there are other 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 problems uh, that we are, we're we're fighting now with the violence. That violence is, is so pervasive. Uh, people have access to guns, and they and they, and and so many people are being killed. I've done a lot of work with the um, um, handgun um, control organization. Uh, it's called the Brady Organization now, uh, with Sarah and uh, Jim Brady. Um, they are, they are uh, people, are, uh, there, there are many things that we can do now uh, to get involved with so many of the causes uh, that, uh, that, that, that are, um, are tending to destroy us. And, and uh, what I, I think that nonviolence allows you to, uh, um, uh, it allows you to and empowers you to do uh, what is necessary uh, because you what you do is build coalitions. You can't do all of it by yourself, but you can put together coalitions and get other people involved or join organizations that are already involved and continue to work to eradicate poverty. Of course, this poverty is still with us very much so. My husband, uh, one of the three triple, the triple evils that he talked about, poverty, racism, and war. And of course, they all are forms of violence. And we have to continue to work to make sure that people everywhere uh, have a, a decent livelihood, that they have jobs, they have housing, they have health care, uh, they have quality education, uh, all of these uh, areas that we still have to work on and to improve so that the quality of life for all people is improved and we can achieve indeed the, the beloved community that Martin talked about that I believe in. No, I really, I never thought that it wasn't the way to go. I always, I guess because of my religious upbringing and uh, you know, I believed that um, even though we kind of stray away from it, but you know what is right. I mean, that you, you have a, you've been taught to, uh, it was wrong to, to kill. I believe that firmly. I believe that you have to try to resolve your conflicts without violence. Uh, I believe that uh, you have to, uh, you have to give something back to society that has nurtured you. And, and so I never got to the point where I felt that nonviolence was not viable. I just felt that when there was violence, 
and it came from within, and very seldom violence did come from within, I realized that it wasn't that it it didn't it what didn't wouldn't work. It's that people didn't follow the proper steps in a trying to achieve it. Because there are a set of principles and there are a set of of steps in the methodology that that we were taught uh, and about nonviolence. And when we follow those, uh, they work. It may take a while, but in order to have a, a, a peaceful solution and a lasting peace, um, it has to be a nonviolent approach. Well, certainly you have to get the best possible education and training that, that, that's available. You have to decide that, that you need to learn as much about the world and society. And these young people live in, in a global village, really. Everybody lives in a global village and a global community. Uh, I didn't know at the time, I didn't live in the global community, but I had a vision of how, uh, that I would be living in a global village. I knew I had to be prepared uh, to be comfortable anywhere in the world. That's, that was what my goal was. So these young people are being prepared differently than I was because they live in a different time. But the most important thing they have to decide is not just to do or to get an education and to be selfish about it, but that they must prepare themselves to give back and to make a difference in the world. We have to create what my husband called the beloved community. If we are to survive, we have to learn how to solve our problems and resolve our conflicts in a nonviolent manner. And, and, and so I, I think it's important for them to realize that they have a personal responsibility, each one of them. When I sat in the um, audience today and I thought about these young people who had gathered and I thought about how this all came together, I just wish that there were more gatherings such as what we have experienced here at the weekend at the International uh, Achieve, Achievement Summit because if we are going to continue to change society for the better, and if our world is to survive, we've got to invest in these young people in a way so that they know which is the best way and the right way. Um, and I think the, the Academy is doing a great job. On March 31st, 1968, just four days before Martin was assassinated, as it has been said by Dean Baxter, he delivered his last sermon entitled, Remaining Awake Through a Great Revolution, right here in this cathedral. In the sermon, Martin inspired us with his unshakable faith in the triumph of good over evil. And he said, with this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair, the stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discord of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. And so today, I want to challenge you to make a courageous commitment, not only to achieve personal success but to use your success to help create this beautiful symphony of brotherhood and sisterhood. And if you embrace this challenge with prayer and faith and determination, you will surely succeed. And the 21st century will become a glorious new age of peace and progress for all humankind. May God bless you all and give you the strength to fulfill your dreams. Thank you.